Coach Ferris's legacy is, will be carried on through his players. Delta State baseball is known around the country, there's no question about it. And it started with Boo Ferris. Coach Ferris uh, is an amazing man, a father figure for all of us that were blessed to play for him. Unique and incredible and uplifting and encouraging and fun and uh, rewarding, all those things. I don't know of anybody that would ever say a bad word about Coach Ferris. Coach Ferris has kind of been in my life for 40 years. Uh, playing for him on that level. Then as I went out and was a high school coach and uh, just him encouraging me and uh, kind of investing in me as a high school coach and then getting the opportunity to come back here for the last 25 years I've been able to be in the same town and had the privilege of being able to see him on a daily basis, uh, talk to him, and I'll miss that. I'll certainly miss that. He, he taught guys how to play baseball or how to become better men and uh, be better at their craft and their sport. He knew nothing about archiving in museums, but he taught me how to become a better archivist and a better curator. And one time I asked him, how do you know I'll remember all this? And he said, because I care. And he truly did care. Very lucky to uh, have him not only pour into my life uh, the history of Delta State Baseball, uh, but also being willing to uh, pour into me and uh, teach me that relationships ultimately so much more important uh, than anything else. Wonderful gentleman. In addition to being a great athlete, he treated me like a son. He's going to be sorely missed. And while baseball, of course, is very important, uh, how you turn out in life matters to him more than the baseball. In the 40 some odd years since I was here playing baseball, he has cared about each and every one of us. He uh, was a wonderful coach, but uh, more importantly, he was a, a mentor and a friend, and, and as I said earlier, a father figure for all of us. And, uh, the experience that I had here playing for him, uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. There is going to be, through the years, through the generations, his influence is going to last forever. He knew that I was sort of down the left field line being nervous and worried and scared. And he made his way down to where I was just to say, you're gonna be okay. <laughs> you're, and that's the way he was. That's what these stories are gonna tell you. That uh, he had a sensitivity about that. He cared for the way we felt. He cared for all his players. And, uh, uh, and that never stopped. And that never stopped. Uh, I had been at East Mississippi Junior College and played baseball over there, and I uh, was looking for a place to go. And so Horace McCool, who was the football coach, was recruiting players, and he came to East Mississippi, and, uh, and we were talking about maybe a possibility of coming over and working as a manager in football, but I wanted to play baseball. So he put me in contact with Coach Ferris, and I uh, had some friends that uh, knew him very well that uh, recommended me. And so uh, I visited with him in the summer. And between Coach Ferris and Coach McCool, I came to Delta State. Uh, you know, I, I'm not gonna dwell on that too much. Um, I think I'll always remember and feel their presence and remember things they've said, uh, kind of you know, I think that it, that impact and their influence will stay with me and therefore it'll stay with the program. I'm committed to continuing to try and keep their, their reputation and their legacy out in front of our players so they know who they are. And as they, you guys come into this program, I always hope we can teach them about those two coaches. And, uh, but uh, yeah, it'll be different. Uh, I've had the opportunity for 
Well, Coach Ferris has kind of been in my life for 40 years. Uh, playing for him on that level. He had a smile, always knew everybody's name. It's amazing how bright and sharp he remained, even until uh, last uh, year or two, I guess. I mean, he just, he was as sharp as a tack. And uh, because of that, I, I, I know he did a great job coaching these kids and the fundamentals of the game of baseball. Highly organized, highly structured. He coached baseball like you want to, to have uh, your son play for him. We went to University of Arkansas Little Rock to play. The umpire before the game asked Boo for his autograph <laughs> while they're exchanging lineup cards. Well, during the course of the game, Boo actually got thrown out of the game. And the whole way out, he's telling the umpire, oh man, I'm new to this game. I don't know anything about this call. You must know more than me. <laughs> I know I was lucky to get to do this with him. Um, he, he taught guys how to play baseball or how to become better men and uh, be better at their craft and their sport. He knew nothing about archiving in museums, but he taught me how to become a better archivist and a better curator just because he's good and um, he, he's invested in people. And he wanted to know me and he wanted to know what I do, how I do it, um, and to encourage me to keep doing it better. I, I think in case folks don't know it, uh, in those days, the schedule was awesome. Uh, we played Alabama, we played Ole Miss, we played Mississippi State, Notre Dame, I could keep naming. We had as many Division I games as we did Division II, and there would be two or 3,000 people here when we played Ole Miss or Mississippi State, something like that. Uh, the support was unbelievable. Uh, it was before the internet and streaming, and uh, not only local, but people from all over. I knew of Boo's Red Sox, uh, you know, fame when I got here, and, and matter of fact, the first fall uh, that we were here together uh, is when uh, the Yankees and the Red Sox finished in 1978, and they had a one-game playoff, and we were all, some of us were pulling for the, for the Red Sox, but some others were pulling for the Yankees, and uh, Bucky Dent hit the very memorable home run that uh, that cost the Red Sox uh, a chance to go to the postseason. And I know Boo was going to go to the postseason games and we would have had some time off, but uh, I know it was disappointing for him. And then, you know, it wasn't many years later that I was a member of the New York Mets and played the Boston Red Sox in the World Series. And I, unfortunately, I had a broken arm and was not in uniform for that. And I, I even had people here in the Delta ask me, well, are you going to pull for the Red Sox because of Coach Ferris, or are you going to pull for the Mets? And obviously that was a, a not a very wise uh, question because as much as I loved Coach Ferris and loved uh, his legacy with the Red Sox, I was a member of the New York Mets, and uh, that was uh, certainly uh, uh, the answer was quite easy to say the Mets. To say that Coach Ferris has an immense amount of faith would be an understatement. Because he had enough faith in me, who did not know anything about baseball, to build a baseball museum about him. And that's pretty audacious to think about, you know, originally. Well, Miriam, I want to say something about her, because she sat out there with a lot of us and froze and uh, <laughs> was very patient and uh, I sat in her area many a game, and uh, that wasn't always easy to listen to what sometimes she had to hear. So she was a trooper. Uh, when I came here in 2001, 2002, uh, and I got to start learning the history of Delta State baseball, uh, I was lucky enough to have Coach Ferris uh, being willing to sit with me in the office, talk to me about our history, share our history with us, and. Uh, certainly one of the things that I truly cherish uh, about my time here at Delta State. Of course there's there's dozens if not hundreds of stories and and some of the most uh, memorable ones for me I'm sure are uh, have been retold and retold but uh, uh, one of the maybe the most uh, uh, personal and private moments that I had with Coach Ferris that for me looking back was was funny in a way was well, it took place on the uh, opening day of my very first year. And uh, I was a freshman, and Delta State's team 
1974 was extraordinarily good. And it was uh, made up mostly of uh, experienced senior players. Most of the team were senior players. And so I was a freshman. I was uh, an outfielder. I was probably you know, second on the depth chart, if you would put it that way. Never ever expecting to play, at least not on that first day of the season, that very first time. And uh, we were on the road to Arkansas State. And uh, I was sort of naively thinking, this is great. You know, I'm just happy to be on the bus. <laughs> I'm just happy to have a uniform and be on the road trip and uh, be ready to see what college baseball is all, all about. And so we've, uh, we're ready, we've dressed, we've come to the field, we're getting ready to play. And Coach Ferris uh, walks down to the, where I was sort of getting loose and it was just he and I. And uh, he said, he said, uh, you know, I've just uh, found out that Arkansas State is gonna uh, pitch a left-handed pitcher against us in the first game. So uh, you're gonna be in the lineup. <laughs> and uh, we, had a, we had a extraordinarily uh, gifted outfielder named Tommy Mims who batted left-handed and just didn't hit very well against left-handed pitchers. And so um, Coach Ferris said, you're gonna start the game in right field and you're gonna bat third. <laughs> and uh, knowing that at some point probably a, a right-handed reliever was going to come in for Arkansas State and Tommy Mims was going to get right back in the lineup and I was going to go right back to the bench. But that moment, as you can imagine, my, heart, you know, my stomach went into my throat, my heart sunk and got about you know, 100 pounds heavier than it had been, and I think. And I, he could see it on my face. <laughs> I'm sure he could. He could see it on my face that, I, what? You know, uh, what? And, um, and uh, he looked at me as he would to any player. He said, you're gonna be fine. It's just like high school. <laughs> and I said, coach, coach, this doesn't feel like high school <laughs> at all. He said, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. And, uh, uh, and we were fine. Um, it, happened, it happened like he said it would happen. But uh, I remember, I remember being more nervous in any situation that I've ever been with a baseball uniform on than the top of that first inning when I had to go to bat in the very first game of the very first year um, because they were pitching a left-handed pitcher at Arkansas State. If there was an umpire that probably didn't like Coach Ferris, it was one out of Arkansas Little Rock where uh, he didn't get just thrown out of the game, he got thrown out of the park. And so Coach Ferris goes, he of course spits on the umpire for several minutes, saying, oh, I've never played this game. I don't know who the, what this is. I've never been here. Made the umpire feel about an inch tall before he left. And so he goes up into the parking lot by the bus. And the next thing you know, he's giving signals down to the guy at the, bull, uh, the dugout. And the dugout coach is giving the uh, signals to the third base coach and so it's just one big fiasco and it's probably the funniest thing I ever saw you know and the way he was doing it he thought he was being real shifty right you know so it was uh, it was comical we loved it oh it was great I mean of course you know coach Kenson playing for him and I mean, just recently watching that video again of when they won the national title and coach Kenson going up into the stands to take that trophy Coach Ferris, I mean, that, that just means so much. I mean, because I know Coach Kennison, it meant so much to him because he didn't think that they they got so close and wanted to win it when he was a player for Coach Ferris. So he it really meant a lot to him just to be able to say, hey, look, we finally got it done for you and to take that up there to him. So I know that meant a lot. And they had a special relationship. Everywhere we went, everyone um, knew Uncle Boo. Um, everyone called him Coach Ferris. Um, you know, being in Kansas City, growing up in a bigger town, um, you know people, but not when you come to this kind of city. Um, so it was, it was nice being here and you feel connected in a way that you don't with anything else. About, about two weeks later, he called me and he said, uh, oh, uh, I checked the rotation. You know, that's Clemens coming back for the Red Sox, uh, for the uh, Yankees, who's former Red Sox, Roger Clemens, pitcher. 
He said, but uh, I, I, think, I think you're okay. Just go to the will call window and we'll have it in, in your name. So we go, we fly up there, nine random people from the Mississippi Delta go to that, come into Fenway Park. And well, I go up to the will call window and I'm like, I'm John Cox. And they said, uh, okay, and they go through and they hand the ticket and they sign. And they said, it's compliments of the organization. And I was like, okay. So I go to the guys, we give the tickets, we walk into Fenway. None of us have ever been in Fenway Park before. So we walk in, we're kind of above it. We can see the field, they're out there taking back practice. The Yankees were actually taking back in practice at that time. And uh, Saturday afternoon, beautiful day in Boston in July. And uh, we walk up to the usher and we're like, well, where's this ticket? And he looks at this gallery of guys with me kind of and looks and he said, man, who do y'all know? Or something like that. And he's like, well, I said, where are our tickets? He said, well, do you see Derek Jeter? who's Yankee shortstops, they're taking bad press down on the field. I'm like, yes, sir. He goes, when you get to him, you've gone too far. So we literally, our feet were on the Red Sox dugout. And so we, we went right there. And it was so funny because uh, when we sat down, the, some of the other people from Boston, of course, filled in as a packed game, sold out. And they were all like, you know, where are you people from? Because they recognize our accents. And we're like, well, we're from Mississippi. And they're like, well, why does someone from Mississippi come to Fenway Park? You know, what, what brings you to this? And we're like, well, our university, our college, a guy played here, coached with, with us. And they were like, well, who? And we would say, well, Boo Ferris. And they would look and they would be like, Dave Ferris? And you know, it was like a god that we had unleashed. And so from then on, we were like surrounded by these people from Boston that would come up. But I always think whenever they say, you know, when the, that usher asks, who do, you, who do you know? Or do you know somebody? You know, because we were the last people that looked like we needed to be sitting by the Red Sox dugout. And we were always like, yeah, we, we know somebody. We, uh, we know Boo Ferris. It's pretty amazing every day to think that the guy that you're playing for pitched a shutout in the 46 World Series. His best friend was Ted Williams. So you listen pretty intently to what he has to offer to you because so, you know he definitely knows what he's talking about. Growing up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Coach was just back at Delta State, and they came down to play what was in Mississippi Southern College. And my dad was the sports information director at, at, at Mississippi Southern. And he was out on the field talking to Coach Ferris before the game when they were taking BP and he waved at me to come out there. And he introduced, uh, introduced him to me as the greatest baseball player that Mississippi has ever produced. And of course I was, again, nine years old, little league. Baseball was everything. I knew every lineup everybody's batting average. And when dad said that to me, it got my attention. But, you know, and he was right. He's still the, the greatest baseball player we've ever produced. But what dad didn't tell me is that he's the, he's the greatest man, the greatest gentleman is the way I should put it. When uh, Ted Williams came and did a hitting clinic, coach gave me a ball and said, get Ted to sign it. And I said, Coach, I'm not, I'm not into autographs. I don't. He said, take this ball, walk over there, get Ted Williams to sign that ball. And he also gave me a postcard. He said, get Ted to sign both of these things. It'll mean something one day. I said, okay, Coach. So I go and I, Ted signs the ball. Ted signs the, the card. I gave the card to my daughter, Laura. She still has it. And then I had Ted's signature. Well, the next thing I know, down through the years, you know, Coach, here comes, you know, Bob Feller to do a clinic. So I take the ball and I get Bob Feller to sign it. And then Robin Roberts signs it. And then I get all these people and then suddenly I look down and, and then, you know, I got Whitey Ford on it. And, and he had done a, a, an event over at Ole Miss after I got over there. And so I, I have this ball and it's got like six or seven Hall of Famers on it. And plus obviously coach, I got a coach to sign it too, you know. So that was, that was something that, you know, I'm certainly glad. But our friendship before the game and after the game, always gentle, always uh, great comments, always, you can see his kids were, were very well schooled, very well coached, uh, treated the, the opposing team very well. And so we didn't mind playing Delta State. Now, it was not an easy series for us because we always played them in midweek games and we had SEC weekends either behind or coming up. But he had the same problem when he got into his conference. So we always uh, seemed to get uh, Boo's number one pitcher. Uh, I always kid him about that. I said, 
Doesn't, don't you save your number one for the conference weekends? You know, the first day of practice in 1966, after practice, Coach Ferry said we had a revival at our church and we'd like to invite the whole team to the revival. And uh, I've had a lot of coaches in my life, but that's the first time I've ever heard a coach mention Christianity. Everyone used to make fun of my name, or everyone spells it with one S. Um, and then finally, one time, I was like, yeah, just Google Boo Ferris, and immediately everyone's amazed. Like, wait, you're related to him? Like, I am, I am. So you can say, and like, I didn't know what any of the numbers meant. I just knew they were impressive, all his baseball stats, so I just went along with it. Like, mm hmm. <laughs> um, and again, my family is so modest, they never talked about it. And so as I came to understand more about the significance of his history, I started talking about it more, and I'm like, why does no one talk about this? Like, why don't, it's like, I thought maybe I was missing some facts or something and it wasn't as big of a deal. And um, just that my family doesn't talk about these kinds of things, so. It, I'm so proud of my relationship with Coach. And like I said, it was like a, he was like a dad to me. And I, I had been raised by my grandparents, so I, I needed some, some adult supervision when I came down here. And, uh, when Ole Miss offered me the job in 1981, I really didn't want to go. And I didn't want to leave. This was my school. And my wife was from here and her parents from here and she had been born and raised here and my, uh, you know, my two children were born here and, and I, I really was, you know, really torn about what, what to do. And I went to see Coach. And I sat down in, the, in his uh, living room and we started talking and he knew that Warner offered it, offered me the job. And I, I told him I, I, I was thinking about not taking it, you know. Well, for the next 30 minutes, Coach Ferris convinced me that this was the right move for my career. And, you know, and after, you know, I had his blessing, because I think that was one of the things I was really concerned about. Well, how's, what's this going? How's coach going to take this, you know? And he convinced me that, you know, if I was going to go in my, you know, career path, uh, that, you know, being the sports and motion director in the Southeastern Conference was one of the top jobs in the country. And so I went home and I told Paula that coach had pretty much given us the blessing to go and that I felt like that after talking to him, it was the right move. But I can truly say that there's not a day that goes by that I haven't missed Delta State. He, he was a master at keeping up with what, in his world, what was going on. He was, he was a great Christian. He was, he was everything. I mean, uh, probably the thing that made still makes one of the deepest impressions to me is my junior year. I had a very bad year personally. I didn't play well at all. The team was good, but I didn't play well. And I actually thought going into the closing conference with Coach, I said. Well, I was thinking he may actually just tell me don't come back. So he met with me privately and said, you know, you didn't have a great year, but you worked hard in the classroom. You took care of your business. He actually gave me a little more scholarship. So that, that made an impression on me like, like none other. He just spoke to, spoke to his character and the class of gentleman that he was. Well, Coach Ferris was all about being simple. Um, one of the things he always said in the locker room after the game was over, he said, ooh, my name was Ernie. That was my nickname. Ooh, Ernie, always say please and thank you. You'll go a long way in life. You'll be successful. And I always wanted to know what this success stuff was about. But being saying please and saying thank you stuck with me. And it's such a nice thing to do. And it gets you a long way with anybody you're talking to, a customer, your mom and dad, anybody. And it just stuck with me. The way he said it always stuck with me. Be able to sit down with him and just talk baseball and he'd be talking about players he'd ask about guys that I was teammates with and how they were doing what they were doing now and just just everything I mean he just wanted to know what was going on and he was very involved at all times with everything going on around here the two words that I think about him is loyal and humble and um, probably a lot of people like me have received mail from him from time to time, he would write me a note that I was at the game and he saw me and he appreciated it. And he would always send pictures of my children and then later my grandchildren when they made the newspaper. 
because he truly cared and I never played baseball nor any of my family, but he cared. When you're 18, 19 year old kid and you are doing, you know, what's a daily, you know, sort of a daily thing, practice and games and all the things that come with it, you don't necessarily appreciate how different this program is and how much Coach Ferris in particular would care for his players. You learn that, yes, while you're here, but you certainly learn it in the years afterwards and the decades afterwards. As anybody will tell you, uh, he would stay in touch with us, he would write us letters, he would send us newspaper clippings, he would invite us back to campus, he would rejoice when we got married, when we had kids, when we you know, had new jobs. He was just, he was always, always interested in uh, our well-being. But uh, he's special. And uh, I didn't have the privilege of playing for him just one year, because my senior year, he went to uh, Mississippi State, Sister Adelaide, right? But if I had three or four years like a lot of these guys, man, you know, they were truly blessed. Yeah. Love Coach Ferris, I love Delta State. People who have had the privilege of playing here at Delta State in general, but uh, those of us that had this specific privilege of playing for Coach Ferris will tell you that we appreciate it more now than maybe we did then. I think Boo's legacy is on the field, his name's in the field, he's got the museum here. But the thing is, legacy is going to be his former players, remembering Boo Ferris, Coach Ferris, and what he did for him, not only on the field, but the type of person he was off the field. Made him men, character, loyalty, perseverance, love. Coach Ferris's legacy is, will be carried on through his players. So the legacy is unlimited. And not only that, but the players will be telling their children about Coach Ferris. So it's, his legacy will live on, on and on and on. But I'm certainly gonna be very saddened. It's a void in my life. But I know he lived a wonderful life. He did so many wonderful things. And he's at peace now. And that's what he wanted in the end. And you know, and that's one thing I want people to remember is we've lost two great coaches this year. And Coach Ferris was larger than life and uh, to all of us. But Coach Marchant uh, invested a lot in this program as well, invested a lot in me, gave me an opportunity to come back and be his assistant coach. Uh, and so certainly I have great respect and feel the loss of both of those. But his impact will live on, you know, none of that ends with uh, his passing. It still will live on and all those guys who played for him. Uh, hopefully as we continue to try and do the same things in the program now, that we've done in the past, uh, you know, it all stems from, from him through Coach Marshawn to hopefully we're doing the right things now. And so I think their impact stays with us. It'll always stay with me personally. And as I said, my relationship has been one where I've been able to sit close by and see him on a daily basis for 25 years. But in a lot of ways, my relationship is no different than so many guys that played for him. He's uh, uh, filled a role as a role model, uh, a dad, uh, and you know, that's true for so many guys.